Welcome to the Secrets of College Planning. I'm your host, Anthony Yuba, and today we're going to get some insight into men's volleyball at the college level. My guest today is Sam Schweisky. He is the men's volleyball coach at Princeton University, and welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah, so uh, Sam, usually I ask my guests where they went to college. So where'd you go to school? I went to Vassar College, uh, upstate New York. I'm born and raised in New York City, and uh, yeah, Vassar was just about an hour and a half up the road, and it was, it was a great fit for me. Great. So uh, let's just go back in time into high school before you got to college. Uh, when did you start thinking about going to college? Was it freshman year, high school, senior year? When did it all start for you? Um, I went to a pretty, uh, pretty focused prep school in New York City, uh, and so they had us thinking about SATs and college and stuff. I would say, yeah, in ninth grade, they kind of had us mapping it out. I mean, um, I had many friends go off to the Ivy League. I mean, it was, it was a very focused high school. So we, we kind of knew um, what it was about. And then, yeah, I think, you know, the guidance counselors knew I, I wanted to do something liberal arts, something like that. So they were kind of pointing me in certain directions. But, you know, I wanted to play men's volleyball. And there's not a lot of men's volleyball in the country. Um, you know, there's still only about 22, 21 Division I programs. Um, there's a handful of Division II and a handful of Division Three. actually a lot more now. Um, and I kind of cross-referenced men's volleyball with kind of with liberal arts, and I didn't want to go too far away from home, and Vassar just kind of had the Goldilocks of all, of everything I wanted, and uh, I went up and visited, and it just, just kind of blew my mind, and it was a perfect fit for me. So, uh, so you, so I'm, I'm assuming you did play volleyball at, at Vassar. I did, yeah. I played in high school, played at Vassar. It was really kind of the, I mean, I defined myself so much as, as an athlete. It was such a beautiful, uh, experience for me to be in this kind of liberal arts, very liberal place, but also have the sports identity. It was just a great balance for me in so many ways. So, so you at Vassar, what's it like? How's it, has it worked as an athlete there and how's it work as a student there? So, you know, it's probably a lot of what drew me to Princeton later on is, 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 you know, the balance there is you're a student first. Everyone is a student and, you know, athletes, we got, a bell or a whistle, you know, we got like a couple of t-shirts and this and that, but it wasn't like we were treated as a complete different class of citizen. And that resonated with me. You know, it was like, yeah, we're all here. We're all academics. We're all doing the work. And then some of us do art, do theater, some do sports. You know, everyone kind of had their extracurricular um, avenue they wanted to pursue. And there, none was better or worse than the other. You know, there was really an equity there that that's kind of made sense the way I was brought up. It just kind of fit for me. Um, so I loved it. And I probably thought, you know, I was more important or special than I was. Everyone has their own, the center of your own play is you. Um, but there was a kind of an equity and a balance uh, at that school that I thought was just very kind of, you know, meritocracy and kind of made sense. You know? Sure, sure. Now, so uh, you graduate from Vassar. How does one graduate from Vassar and become the uh, head men's uh, volleyball coach at Princeton University? Well, it's interesting. So I graduated from Vassar May of 2001. And I spent the summer coaching volleyball camps and wasn't sure what I was going to do. And, and I, got a, I got a job off. So I majored in uh, Hispanic studies and I spoke fluent Spanish. And I, was really, I lived in Spain for a semester and I was passionate about the Spanish language. And I got offered a job coaching at the University of New Haven. Uh, and the head coach at the time was Peruvian, spoke almost no English. And the team was about 80% Latin American. They had Ecuador, Peru, Venezuela, and three white guys from Connecticut. <laughs> and so the, the guy pitched me on like, hey, you can speak Spanish, you can translate, you can coach volleyball. Uh, I didn't really pay much, but it sounded interesting. And I, I rented a car for $26 on, on the morning of September 11th, 2001, oh, wow. to drive from New York City to Connecticut to take this interview. And I get halfway there and the Twin Towers are hit. And the whole world changes. And I can't, I can't leave Connecticut. New York City's locked down. So I take this job for $2,000 for the year, which my mom would remind me is not really a job, it's more of a hobby. Uh, <laughs> and I started substitute teaching to kind of make ends meet. I was teaching Spanish in middle school and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I was just kind of in it and enjoying coaching, but I was sitting on the sidelines convulsing. Like I wasn't ready to coach yet at 23. You know, I, I wanted to play. And, and that's when I emailed some friends who were playing over in Europe. And I said, how did you guys get over there? What'd you do? And they said, oh, you, this, this uh, company, Bring It USA, you got to go through them. And so I sent them a video of me playing in college. And I still, I have this email saved somewhere. And the guy's a friend of mine now. He sent me an email back and he said, um, saw your film. 
the level is not so terrible that you would destroy our tour. If your check clears, you're welcome to come. <laughs> so I said, because because I because I played D three. I was a good D three player, but th this was all, you know, Penn State, Pepperdine, UCLA. This was all top D one guys. So I kind of got on as this D three defensive specialist guy. Went to Europe, played a year of semi pro in Holland, and it just was back to my idea of living in Spain. Now I got to live in Holland, learn the culture, learn the language. It was and, and volleyball was the vehicle. You know, volleyball gave me a, teammates and friends, and it was it was it was great. And um, did they pay you? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a generous term, you know, uh, you know, I, they got me sort of a job at the front desk, you know, and so I would check sport cards and sometimes in the canteen, I would pour beer and hang out and they paid me a little bit. The coach would have me babysit his kids and they pay me a little bit. They, you know, they, they looked after me and, you know, it was enough to eat some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and learn the culture. And, and that's why I tell my guys, I go, go play in Europe after college. Like, once you get older into your career, you're not going to want to sleep in a bus station and eat it. You know, I went to an overnight bus station through Poland and I met some buddies and went to the, like, you have adventures at that age and you don't care. My mom said, you slept in a bus station. I was like, yeah, it was an overnight thing, whatever. It, you know, you're just open for anything at that age. And um, it was a blast. It was a total blast. And, uh, you know, I came back, I was 24 and I was thinking, okay, I, maybe I should get a master's. I should maybe you know, this was a good year, but my brain was getting a little, you know, wanted to do some more stuff. So I applied for, a, I mean, I want to do sports psychology. You know, I had, I'd taken a class at Vassar. It really kind of opened my eyes. I was an okay athlete and that's probably an, an exaggeration. I was, a, I was a medium athlete, but the sports psych thing, I became the best of my ability. And all of a sudden I was maximizing this moderate athletic talent. I was hitting the ball well all the time. And I, I just, and I was so you know, mind blown by it. I thought, let me get a master's in this. Cause I started looking at coaching volleyball. I thought maybe I want to do this. And a lot of things said master's preferred master's preferred. I thought, okay, let me get a master's in, in, in something where I can use it in my coaching. And I looked all over the country, a bunch of places. And I found Miami of Ohio had this great top notch master's program in sports psychology. Uh, and Ohio is different. Ohio is different than the Northeast. I wanted to see something different. So I went out there for two years. I got a master's. Uh, I coached under Carolyn Condit. She'd been there for 30 years. And she taught me so much about the business and treating people with respect. I mean, she, she knew every janitor by name. She knew everybody. And, I, and there was just something amazing about not the volleyball, not the X's and O's, but just the, the class with which she did it. I was so enamored with that. And um, she taught me how to motivate players and staff with, with uh, sugar, not with you know, reprimand. You know, I, mean, I remember, I remember she gave me a VHS tape and we were playing Marshall and she said, Hey, would you mind watching and, and seeing if you have any notes? And I thought, wow, the head coach, I'm a little lowly grad assistant. Okay. I watch the VHS. I take all these notes. I come in the next day. I said, you know, I watch all the notes and number 25, she, she, I think she gets cross court predominantly. And, and she goes, wow, that's so insightful. We'll use that in tonight's, the game plan had been written days ago. She's just humoring. She's just encouraging me. You know, sure, we sure. beat Marshall in three. And after in, after in the locker room, she, this is all women's volleyball. We come in the locker room and tells the girls, you know, the staff did a great job and, you know, and really Coach Schweisky with some really insightful things. You know, anyone with any knowledge of volleyball could have seen the things that I saw. It was really nothing special. But I, I said, Coach, I'm happy to watch more film. Like, you know, what can I do? And it was just a great lesson. And if you appreciate the people that work for you or play for you and you give them pats on the back consistently, they're going to want to do more for you. And um, I just, I really appreciated that. That was my first sort of bug into coaching was like, th this could be really a really fun, fun thing. And I went, I went from there to coach at UNLV. I went for a year and a half at Las Vegas, assistant coach with the women. Then I went for a year and a half to central Florida uh, with the women. It's all women's volleyball. Women's volleyball is really the, the parent sport in our business. Um, and someone told me early on, you know, if you want to coach volleyball, you coach women's volleyball. That's the, that's the, the paradigm. Uh, and then I was 30 years old working in Florida. And I saw this thing in ads for Princeton. It said, head men's coach and assistant women's coach, the dual job. And I thought, well, I have, women, I have some men's experience. I coach at New Haven. I played, you know, and I have a background in, you know, my high school and my college were sort of academically. Put an application in. And I got an interview and I can't, and, I, and it was like the times in your life when you just like, like when I walked on the Vassar campus, it just felt right. I walked on the campus and I nailed the interview. I just had the right amount of everything. And there were people that applied for that job had way more men's experience, but no women's experience. Some people had way more women's experience, no men's experience. 
Some people weren't the right age. You know, I was 30. I had worked for a female boss before. This would be a female boss. I was very comfortable with that. Some people weren't ready for that. You know, I just, I just, I Goldilocks it. It just fit right. Uh, and I was, you know, I think it was five years, five or six years as doing both. And then they transitioned. They had enough sort of revenue to get a full-time women's assistant. And I shifted over just to do the men, which was always going to kind of be my, my passion. Uh, but it was nice to do both and to share with the other, with the women's head coach and kind of share things. So it, it's been a great, it's been a great, I mean, I, I hear myself saying it. It's like, yeah, I couldn't have written a better script. Uh, to get to come back to Princeton, the Northeast, being close to my family in New York, I mean, it just, you know, your 20s, time to travel and explore and then kind of come back to your roots and get to go to, you know, family events and stuff. It's, it's really been, I'm very, very fortunate. So let's get into uh, men's volleyball. Um, how does it all work? Uh, you know, give us a little background on men's volleyball at the college level. Uh, you said there's only a few handful of schools, in division one. So what, what uh, what's it, what's it all about? Well, you know, it's interesting because there's so few schools, there's really a, a sense of community. Um, and I felt it when I played, you know, I went out to the Penn state camp as a junior in high school and you know, the head coach at the time, Mark Pavlik, this would have been 96, you know, as a coach, do you know the players at your camp? I don't know. He shook my hand, you know, three years later, I'm at Vassar. We're playing Penn state and he shakes my hand after the game. And he says, you've really improved Sam since we saw you. I mean, I was like, Oh my God, this guy like cares about me. And then you fast forward 10, 15 years later, I take the Princeton job. He takes me out to lunch and we're sitting there at lunch at, at Penn state. And I said, well, I'm thinking about putting together a handbook of like offense, defense, sports psychology, nutrition, this and that. But I don't, and I'm at, and he goes, yeah, when we get back to the office, I'll show you my, I'll show you Penn State's. And he shows me this booklet. It's got to be 80 pages. It's got everything Penn State does, you know, soup to nuts. And I'm trying to take like photographic pictures of it, like espionage. And he goes, you can have it. That's last year's book. We change it a little bit each year, but help yourself. And I was blown away. Um, blown away because on the women's side and it's not a, a gender comment it's more just a size comment you know women's volleyball there's so many 330 teams in division one alone everyone's got their secret sauce everyone's got their you do it this way and everyone wants to kind of be protective of that sure. on the men's side there's a you know, there's also less money in men's volleyball coaching so there's a there's like and i don't want to speak for everyone but there's a more relaxed like yeah i'll share I, if you get better i get better you know and also there's less movement like I've been here for 12 years. I'm not going anywhere. I'll be here for another two decades. And so there's less sort of cutthroat, like, oh, when that person leaves, I might take that job. And everyone kind of settles in and helps each other and shares. And it's a really nice feeling, you know? So, so now what type, of, uh, what type of guys do you look for at uh, Princeton University or at a Division I school in general? Because there's many people that will watch this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm fortunate enough to have an incredible assistant coach now who does, he's the recruiting coordinator. So he's emailing and calling and like the whole country. And then he funnels up to me kind of the cream of the crop. And I just have a nice little thing in my, it's nice being the boss when you can kind of delegate. <laughs> um, but it's, they have to hit so many metrics, right? First is the academics. So they have to, have, and this is the hard part too. We can't talk to kids uh, younger than junior year. So it's like, coming into their junior that summer, we can start talking to them. Sometimes it's too late. You know, you get in touch with the junior, you go, wow, I love watching you play. You know, what's, and they haven't taken the SAT yet, but they had a couple C's early on, they can't come back from. Which if they knew maybe freshman year, like, hey, you might have a chance to, to play at this level and come to the school, go and get a C. You know, stay, stay diligent, stay focused on your work. So you, you got to have strong grades. You don't have to have all A's, but you can't have really a lot of blemishes. You kind of have to be... B plus, A minus, you know, um, and then and then the testing, you know, which is now kind of in flux with COVID and everything, but you got to typically do well on the test score. So academics is kind of the first piece. Um, athletics, you know, you have to have either an incredible physical specimen that we think, wow, that's the physicality, even though it's not refined and maybe the skills aren't all there, that physicality could compete at this level uh, or an incredible skill set. Like, oh my God, that skill set is just so, or ideally the both. Right. Um, and then, uh, you know, financially, we got to go through the process of seeing, do you qualify for the aid? Do you need the aid? You know, we have a very good financial aid program. I mean, it's funny. We don't offer athletic scholarships. And a lot of people go, oh, my God, how do you compete with UCLA, Penn State, Pepperdine? 
Well, it's honestly not that big of an issue in men's volleyball because men's volleyball only offers four and a half scholarships in the division one side. So they're usually only giving partial rides to everybody. So when you compare it, most people are like, well, I qualified for a, a bunch of aid. My parents said they can send me to the school I want to go to, you know. Um, the biggest piece when it comes down to the end of the recruiting is the fit. You know, does it fit? Does it feel right? And that, unfortunately, we're doing over Zoom right now. But typically, you come visit. You come spend a weekend. You spend some time with the guys. You go to a meal. You go to a party. You come to a – sit at a game. You, you feel like, is this my kind of, my kind of group? Uh, and vice versa. Is this my kind of, kind of guy? And I've been trying to do more over Zoom – with parents trying to get to the, you know, the apple doesn't often fall far from the tree, right? So you kind of, you know, you ask some questions and I'll tell you in this day and age, in this moment, in the last six months or a year where you have, you have COVID-19, you have a huge sort of racial justice moment over the summer and continuing getting into dialogues with family about how are you, how is COVID affecting you and your family? And how, how is this racial, are there protests in your area? What's, what's your perspective on that? That's a great window into the values and who the people are, what they, what they, what they prioritize. Um, and it's not to say that we only have certain types of people here, but everyone that, that comes here has to be considerate and they have to be thoughtful of the people they live around and, and based on you know, different things. So it's, it's been a good window into that. So now uh, I'm assuming the men have to be tall. Uh, do they have to play high school or is it more AAU? Is it beach volleyball? Yeah. What? Tall, yeah. So there's a club club. It's called club is the, is the AAU equivalent. Yeah. That's our primary focus is recruiting through club. Um, high school is a nice sort of ancillary thing, but club really collects all the best players. You can see them at the best tournaments. And even now we can watch online. So nine times out of 10, you have to play for a pretty good club team. Yeah. Height. If you're a front court player, I mean, we have some defensive specialists like I was that height is not always the most important thing. That's more of a skill thing, but for any front court player, height, physicality, explosiveness. Um, and, you know, every recruiter has their secret sauce. You hear people say, well, you take the dad's foot size, you divide him by the mom's hip angle. It's like, no, no, everyone's guessing where are these kids going to end up down the road. And the truth is it's, it's more about their own personal perseverance and, and how hard are they going to work. Uh, some kids grow physically, some kids don't, but the kids that come in extra for extra reps, that watch film, that train, that's the ones when you see, oh my, that's, I see why this kid is going there. And that's what you're trying to figure out in the recruiting process. Who has it in their DNA? Who's going to come and have a tough problem set and be Princeton's hard. It's difficult, but I can't wait to get to practice. I can't wait to come play some volleyball. You know? So now what is, uh, when a student gets there, uh, what is the, the year of a student athlete at Princeton playing volleyball? Do they get there in July? Do they get there in September? Uh, do they play all year round? Is it just a half a season? How, how does it all work? And what, what's the schedule that you give them for the whole year? Yeah, so for men's volleyball, we're our spring, we're a winter spring sport. So the fall is, is not our traditional season, which is nice because like the women's team comes in early, which there's a benefit to that too, but it also cuts into your summer. So they have their whole summer. They come in in September when every student would come in. Uh, and it kind of, we kind of ease them in, you know, it's nice. We're only allowed a certain number of hours in that time period. So usually we practice maybe twice a week. We try to lift two to three days a week to kind of get them acclimated. Um, but they're, they're drinking through a fire hose, especially the first years. You know, they're kind of figuring out how it all works. And so, you know, we're not inundating them with too much volleyball at that time. You, we have a fall break, usually around October. When they come back from that in November, we pick up the pace a little bit. Um, sorry, we pick up the pace a little bit. We start going three, four days a week. And then we take the break from the winter and we come back in January and that's when it's kind of full speed. That's when it's six days a week. You should play, you train for four days. You play Friday, Saturday off Sunday. That's kind of the, the D1 cycle. Uh, and that runs pretty much, you know, January through the end of April, early May. Um, we travel quite a bit, which is nice. So we play a top tier schedule, go out to California, play UCLA, USC, all those guys. Uh, in um, spring break, we'll go out and we'll play, at, you know, out in Chicago or something like that. But we only fly when we're not in, in class. So over winter break, intercession, stuff like that. So we get the top tier schedule, but when class is in session, we're leaving Thursday night. We're driving down to Penn State, who's in our league, play them Friday, play St. Francis Saturday. You're back Saturday night. You can go to a party Saturday night. You can sleep in, study Sunday. You kind of have a rhythm. You know, like I was, I've been in other schools where you're flying Wednesday to go. It's brutal if you're trying to be a mechanical and aerospace engineer, you know? 
Um, so, you know, the, and we have a lot of guys that are in similar, we have a lot of guys in economics and business, a lot of guys in engineering, and they sit on the bus and they, they work together. And I'll say, hey, you guys want to watch like a movie? And they go, coach, we're trying to study so we can go to a party when we get back to campus. So we can study. So, like they really have all the pieces mapped out for balance. And that's probably our biggest recruiting pitch is that, you know, if you want to optimize only for sports, this might not be the place for you. But if you want to optimize for a great athletic experience, a top academic experience, and a social component, and that could be some guys are into Dungeons and Dragons and movies, some guys are parties, whatever that other piece to your life is, there should be some space for it to let off steam and not just be volleyball and school. And Princeton offers a really nice balance for that, that, that a lot of people really resonate with. So what's the, what's the season for men's volleyball? Is it uh, 20 games, 30 games? What, what, what's yeah, so it's 28 is the max. Um, and so we usually come in right around mid twenties. You know, it's funny. Sometimes we've pushed it to the max and it, you get excited. Like, oh my God, we have to play this team and that team. And the more you play, the better you get, but you also got to peak at the right time and you got to be fresh when it comes into playoffs. So it's scheduling is a tricky balance of when can you get good matches, but also make sure you've built in some rest for your conference games. And by the time you hit the conference tournament, be kind of, you know, be ready to go. So it's yeah, there, mid mid twenties. Is there a, a, an NCAA tournament afterwards? Yeah, so there's so uh, last in well last year didn't happen 2020 2019 uh, we won our conference the IVA for the first time in 21 years last time was was 98 so we won that and so we got uh, a bid to the fight it was a final four they pushed to a final six now it's a final seven they're trying to get it to a final eight um, so we were the final seven and we had a playing game with with uh, Barton down in Carolina as we beat them. And we got pushed to the final six, which was out at Long Beach. And we played Pepperdine in the final six and, and lost in five sets. And it, we were right there in the fifth set. It was a pretty, pretty special experience. So that's kind of what we're, what we're searching for. Wow, that's amazing. So, uh, so then a student that comes there, what, what can they expect from you as the coach, from the team, and from the school? Well, I think from the school, they can expect that, that their welfare is going to be put first. You know, and that's... That's, I think, what we've been trying to, I don't want to call it spin, but, but focus on during this COVID time. I, I don't know how much your viewers know, like, we're not competing right now. The, the Ivy League has said no competition for, for, for winter sports, for most spring sports, certainly for men's volleyball. Um, and our league is competing. Penn State, uh, George Mason, St. Francis, they're, they're all playing. And it's a bummer, but it is what it is. And it's, but it's based on the very central philosophy that the student's health and well-being comes first and foremost. And, you know, you can debate the science back and forth, but if there's a risk of people dying, they're not taking that risk. And I kind of appreciate them taking that stand. I mean, I wish we were competing. I'm a volleyball coach. I love to compete, but it, they didn't feel they could do it safely. And so they said, we're not going to do it. So I think you can, you can rest assured they're going to take care of you uh, from a safety standpoint first. The Ivy League was the first league to shut down last year. And everyone thought they were out of their minds. And all of a sudden, the whole world caught up. So, you know, things based on science and fact, like I'm appreciative of that. What can they expect from me? It's not just about volleyball, you know, and I think that's an important piece. Like, yeah, volleyball matters. Winning championships is important. Um, it's about community. It's about learning and growing. I mean, right now we're meeting once a week on Zoom because we, we have 10 guys on campus. We have seven guys that are on, on gap to the gap year. We meet once a week. We do team building stuff. We do, we're reading a book on racial justice and we talk through like pretty heavy things. We try to get vulnerable with each other. I've been doing things like that for 12 years and it's a little more in mode now, which is good. I, I want everyone to sort of jump on board, but I had colleagues that said like, you're talking about your feelings and why are you just are you talking about Kaepernick taking a knee? Yeah. We're talking about this stuff because it's, it's important. And we're talking about it because we're a family and we need to, you know, you're not going to talk through this with your, with your team. This is a, this is a dinner table conversation you'd have with your, with your wife, your son, your daughter, your husband, your kids talk about it. So, I think, and that's one of the reasons our alumni are so fiercely connected is because they had an experience. And this predates me that the old coach did things differently, but managed to have that same community feel. The alums are, they're, you know, they're orange. They're orange and black through and through. Um, so I think, you know, you, you can see my, my screensaver. I love it. You know, we had like a thousand people in the gym, played Penn State and like, you know, beat them in the finals. It's a fun athletic environment, but it's more than that. Uh, and I think, I think the kids that get attracted to this, they, they feel that. So now, what do you find as the students uh, that play men's volleyball? Are they more the kids from America, or do you find a lot of kids from 
overseas uh, wanting to come to the schools here? Well, there's definitely a lot of volleyball. Uh, men's volleyball is very popular in, in Europe and all overseas. We have a lot, we have a very difficult time getting internationals in because of the rigorous uh, testing and stuff like that. So we have, we don't have very many internationals at all. My buddy at NGIT has got a team full of internationals. He's got a Spaniard, he's got an Italian, he's got the Brazilian. I mean, it's beautiful to hear six languages going on on one court as they're playing incredible volleyball. Um, but for us, yeah, we're, we're pretty much US based. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll listen, we, anybody, you send me an email, you've got the qualification, I don't care where you're from, we'll look at it. If you've got the goods, come on in. Um, but, you know, Southern California and Northern California, uh, Chicago, upstate New York, um, those are kind of some of our hubs where once you have a relationship with a, with a club director, with a school, and also if a guy emails his buddy and said, hey, you know, I remember you, you were too old to me, you're playing, how do you like it? Oh, I love it here, you should come. Those pipelines some tend to feed themselves and we try not to get stuck in them because you, you know, I've had guys from Texas, Colorado, like Arizona. If you have, if you have what we think is the right fit, I don't care where you're from. Um, so we're trying to have pipelines in all, in all areas, but, uh, but yeah, some of the, the natural ones kind of repeat themselves. So, uh, we're coming to the end of our show and okay. uh, usually I ask my guests, uh, what advice do you want to give to the parents, the students that want to come to a school like Princeton and want to play men's volleyball? What do you, what advice do you want to give them? Well, I would advise them to be, um, proactive, you know, I mean, I think, you know, I remember when I was making my little video and back then it was a VHS tape. Now it's YouTube and you send it out. It's so much easier. You can, you can email every coach with a YouTube link. I was trying to think, am I going to pay for postage on the VHS, but be, be proactive and don't, don't, don't have an ego about, you know, you're waiting for a coach to contact you. Ego typically gets in the way in anything you're going to do, you know, be humble, be excited. If you like Princeton or whatever school it is, send an email, you know, right now, because of COVID things are a little bit tricky, but if they, we have a volleyball camp, come to our volleyball camp. Uh, go to Penn State's camp, go to George Mason, go to every camp, visit every, and I tell this to every recruit, look, look at everything, turn over, there's not 200 schools, there's a, and once you start thinking about your region and where you, academically, you can narrow it down, investigate, spend a weekend, spend time with the team, you know, I really think it's important for the, for the student athlete to take the lead, sometimes parents keep emailing us, we go, that's great, can we talk to your son, uh, parents should be involved, parents should be part of the Zoom conversations here and there, it's a family decision, but I love to see it when the student is, is driving it because that's the relationship that is going to matter for the next four years. So be proactive, ask questions. Hey, are you recruiting my position? Honestly, what do you think my chances are? You know, like most times if you ask us a direct question that helps put us in the right conversation that you want to hear. Um, and, you know, shoot for the stars, but, but cast a wide net, you know, and, and see what's out there. You know? Great. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so you've been watching The Secrets of College Planning. I'm your host, Anthony Uva. Until next time.